verse 4. The Bible says, And they journeyed from Mount Or by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses, Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Okay? Okay, so let's say those last two words once together. Ready? Ready to say it? He lived. Okay, ready? He lived. Let's say it with emphasis. Slow. Okay, ready? He lived. He lived. Okay, he lived. Let's pray and we'll ask God to show us how that we can know that we are going to live and two, that we can show other people how to know that they're going to live as well. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much tonight for the Word of God and that we know that it's true because it was given by you. Lord, on a personal level, I thank you for the life that came to me because of the truth that's illustrated by this passage of Scripture. And Lord, I pray that you would help each of these teenagers here tonight to have a very clear understanding of what is necessary in order to live. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Before I tell the story, I, I want to practice just memorizing. I want us to try to memorize the actual address or the chapter and verse of where this is at in the Bible. So we call that a reference in the Bible. Reference means refers to where it's at. So the reference for this story is uh, Numbers 21. So Numbers chapter 21. We know we read verses 4 through 9, but if you found chapter 21, you know where it's at in the Bible. Now, here's why I want us to remember it. The reason I want us to remember Numbers chapter 21 is because... We all stretched out. <laughs> the reason I want us to remember Numbers chapter 21 is because this is actually a place in the Bible that you need to know where it's at so you can show it to your friends. I know many teenagers that would like to, just in a conversation, maybe you're just having a serious conversation with your friend. Maybe your friend's a little bit down about something, or maybe your friend's a little bit confused about heaven and eternal life and all those things. And you need to be able to have answers. You need to be able to know where in the Bible you can tell someone how to know that they have eternal life, that they're going to live. And this passage that we're in tonight is Numbers 21.9. Okay, you ready? Let's say it. Numbers 21.9. Numbers 21.9. Where's it at? Numbers 21.9. Okay, Numbers 21.9. What numbers? Numbers 21.9. All right, 21.9 what? Numbers. Numbers. Numbers 21.9. Are you guys got that? Yeah. Numbers 21.9. Now here's the cool thing about being your age. I leave here at night and I can forget Numbers 21.9 pretty easily. I can, I can say it over and over and over again and it's, whoop, it'll go right out of my mind. But you guys won't forget it. I know where it is in the Bible because I've known about it for a long time. I've looked at it over and over and over again in my life. But listen to me. Listen to me carefully now, guys. If I had somebody that came to me and they said, Pastor, could you explain to me how I can know I have eternal life. I'd take them to Numbers 21.9. That's where I'd go in my Bible. And by the way, it's, it's a cool place, actually. It's a cool story. I mean, just by itself, the story is pretty awesome. Here's what's happened. Uh, God has had about two and a half to three million people that were slaves in Egypt. God has miraculously delivered them out of Egypt. The Bible says with a strong hand. In other words, when the children of Israel were led out of Egypt by Moses, by the time they were led out of Egypt, Egypt was so devastated because of trying to keep the children of Israel as slaves and because of trying to not do what God had said to do that literally they had been devastated. They'd had the plagues. They'd had locusts eat everything in the land. They'd had 
Uh, they'd had the waters turn into blood. They'd had every firstborn son in Egypt had died by the time they let the children of Israel out of Egypt. Then even after Pharaoh had been really broken down to where he realized, I have to let God's people go. I can't stop this. I can't resist God this way. Even after that happened, Pharaoh and his armies pursued the children of Israel. God parted the Red Sea. The children of Israel walked through the Red Sea. Guys, can you imagine this? Walking through, you'd be back walking out to the Atlantic Ocean on the beach here, and God just opens a channel and you just walk through it. And that's what they did. A couple million people walked through. The Bible says on dry land. Not on mud, but on dry land. And then when Pharaoh and his armies tried to pursue after them, then God made the waters cover them, and they literally were... The Bible uses the term as sort of like preserved there. In other words, they're probably still there. You could go find where Pharaoh and his armies tried to follow the children of Israel through. And God had the children of Israel erect a pillar on the... On the uh, they erected a pillar there as a memorial on the edge of uh, the Red Sea. And it was a place of great deliverance. God was very good to Israel, wasn't He? Now, at this time... Aaron, who is Moses' brother and who had gone to Egypt, he'd actually died and his priestly office of being the high priest had been passed on to his son, Eliezer. You don't need to remember that, but everything I tell you from here on, I think it'd be helpful for you to remember. Now, we read the whole story, but I want to talk about it just a little bit. The, 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 the Israelites in the wilderness had tried to go through an easy way by the Red Sea through a country called Edom. Now, if you know where the country of Edom, where the Edomites lived, if you know who those people were, the Edomites were actually the descendants of Esau, who was Jacob, that is, Israel's brother. So they were distant relatives of the Israelites. And the Israelites said, can we pass through the land so we don't have to go the long way around? And the Edomites said, we don't want you in our land. We're afraid you're going to walk in our fields and you're going to harvest our grapes and you're going to trample our you're our gardens and you're going to destroy our land and plunder our things and we don't want you in our land. And so they negotiated with them. They said, no, we'll go through on the main highway. And if our cattle go off the road and they drink water, we'll pay you for it. And we'll make it right. We just need to pass through because there's so many of us and because it would take us literally months to go the other way instead of passing through. And the Edomites said, no. They were relatives. They were family. And they said, no. You can't pass through here. Now, how many of you, if you really needed something, if you really needed something to eat or something to drink or you just needed help with something, how many of you would appreciate it if a relative told you, no? I'm not talking about something unreasonable. I'm not talking about, hey, you know, give me some money. Well, you don't have a right to your friend's money or your family's money, right? But there are some things that just to be gracious, people can do. I think about it this way. Uh, where Germancy and where Winsky live, uh, where they live at, there's a fence. Out to Al Winsky's back door, right? You can go out your back door, is that where the fence is at? Okay, there's a fence right there, out the back door. Now you can either go out of their house and you can walk down 38th Street and go to Andrews, and then you can walk up to, what is that, like 37th Court or 30, 36th, and then go in the neighborhood. Or you can go out Winsky's back door and jump the fence, and you're right there. Okay, do you jump the fence? Yes. How often do you guys go around? One, when I feel fat. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so Winsky goes around all the time. <laughs> so anyway, all right, so now this is the way I look at it, okay? Now supposing, supposing there was an emergency and Winsky needed to get to Germancy's house, right? And so he needs to get to Germancy's house and he can either go the long way around and it would take, how, many, how long would it take if you ran, if you went the long way around? What do you think? Two minutes. Think, it would probably take more than two minutes, one, wouldn't one, it? Five. About five minutes. I'm going to say, we've got to race you guys and see how fast you can do it sometime. <laughs> okay, we've got to record this. Anyway, so it would take, it'd be the difference between over the fence or minutes to go around. You guys understand the difference? Now, we're talking about here, you know, walking through in like a, a day or two, and we're talking about months. It's a big difference, isn't it? For the Israelites to go through Edom or to go around. And the Edomites said no. And I'll tell you what happened in, the, in, in, uh, in Israel. The Israelites got kind of down about it. They were upset with the Edomites. 
They had some trouble with the Canaanites in the land. And then things were kind of tough for them. I mean, they had a long walk. Now, you guys may not think too much about this, but if I started you all off walking and you said, hey, Pastor, how far do we have to walk? I'd say, oh, just a couple months. You'll be back. You'll be back. <laughs> I don't think you can make California a couple months. It'd be a pretty long ways. But it'd be a long ways. You say, how, how long get a walk? Uh, how are we going to get our stuff there? Oh, you can just carry it. Everything you own. We can walk your cattle. How are we going to feed our cattle? Where's the water? Well, you know, I mean, let's have figured out. See, it's a big deal, isn't it? How many of you, if that happened to you, would not, would you, you'd say, man, that's bad. I'd be a little down about it. I'd be a little bothered about it. And I think that it's reasonable that the children of Israel are bothered about it. But I want to look at something. Where did I put my Bible? Right here. Oh, thanks, Luke. I thought maybe Winsky took it from me or something for that comment about him needing to run a lot. Um, the Bible says in verse 4 of Numbers 21 that the soul of the people was much discouraged. And Are you looking at verse 4? Look at verse 4 with me. The soul of the people was much discouraged. Why? See the last bit? Because of the way. In other words, it's a hard way. They're having a hard time. And teenagers, listen, I would never be the person to diminish or to say that some of the things that you have to go through are easy. You know, I think sometimes kids go through things that are tougher than a lot of adults have to go through. They really do. And so, I don't know what the circumstances are in your life, but it could be, it could be that things are kind of tough. Could be that the things that you have to deal with in your home or in your family or some of the things that have just been going on for years and maybe you kind of got used to, sometimes it could be a tough way. It could be a tough road. I just want to tell you something. Sometimes the way will discourage you. But there's a right response and there's a wrong response to the discouragement. Here's what they did when they were discouraged. The Bible says, and the people spake against God. Now, we're sympathetic to being discouraged because of the way, aren't we? But young people, I'm not sympathetic to speaking against God. Say this with me. God is always right. God is always right. God is always right. Hey, God knows things you don't know. And I guarantee you, God loved these people that He delivered out of Egypt more than they could know. God knew what was wrong that the Edomites did. By the way, later on, God dealt with those Edomites. Later on, God judged them. So God's always right. But the Bible says because the way was hard that they spoke against God. And it said, and they also spoke against Moses. And folks, I want to just tell you something. A lot of times, well-intentioned, reasonable people can be very unreasonable when they try to figure out what's wrong. A lot of times we just get discouraged and boy, we're ready to be down on everybody and everything. I've seen people before, they had some things happen in their life and they got discouraged and they said, I'm going to quit going to church. Their problems had nothing to do with church. Didn't have to do with anything being wrong at church. But they just had problems in life and they got discouraged and they said, I'm not going to go to church anymore. I must tell you something, that makes no sense at all. That has nothing to do with anything. God didn't do anything wrong to the children of Israel. He delivered them from Egypt where they were slaves. But the way was hard and they were discouraged and they spake against God. And the Bible says, and they spake against Moses. Then the Bible says, they said, Wherefore have we brought us up out of Egypt? I'm about to read something really funny, so pay attention. It's in verse 5. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in this wilderness? For there is no bread Neither is there any water. And our soul loatheth this light bread. I think that's one of the funniest statements in the Bible. They said, there's no bread. And there's no water. And we don't like the bread. You guys get that? They said, there's no bread. And there's no water. And we hate the bread. How do you hate bread that doesn't exist? How do you do that? you see that in your Bible? Uh, there's no bread. There's no water. And I hate the bread. I can just hear the wine in it. Can't you? Just the crybaby in it. I mean, I hate the bread. What bread? What bread? There's no bread. That's what I just said. What bread do you hate? There is no bread, you said. 
Well, we could be like a Dr. Seuss rhyme. There is no bread, you said. <laughs> okay. What bread? Well, I'll tell you the bread. The bread that God made fall from heaven every single day. Manna. That bread. The bread that no matter where they were, anywhere in the world, they were guaranteed that when they got up in the morning, it would be on the ground. And they just have to pick it up. They didn't have to go out to work to earn it. They didn't have to, they didn't have to put it ingredients together to make it, God gave it to them. Just gave it to them for nothing. And they said, there's no bread, there's no water, and we don't like the bread. Okay? Now here's two things that they're wrong about, aren't there? The way was tough. The way made them discouraged. But when they got discouraged, they blamed God and Moses. And when the way got discouraged, they claimed that they didn't have what they needed but they actually did. And teenagers, I want to tell you something. Discouragement will make you an unreasonable individual. You allow yourself to succumb to discouragement. You get your eyes off of the things being what they are. And it's really easy to get ungrateful, isn't it? Man, I've been, I've been ungrateful before. I sure try not to. And I'll be honest with you. I hope I've grown to the place where ungrateful people get on my nerves. I, and they really do. Man, I, man, people complain about stuff. I just don't like it. You know, things are pretty good in here, aren't they? You know what we did? Uh, how many of you guys were here last year when our air conditioning was broken? You all remember, air conditioning was broken. It was pretty hot in here. And when the air conditioner was broken, it was hot in here, I had to remember that's a real good thing we have a roof just to keep the rain off of us. But we wanted an air conditioner pretty badly. You know what we did? Mr. Lee fixed the air conditioning in our church. And he got it working really well. And he got it working so well, man, we cranked it. We're like, let's get this air. Let's see what it can do. Let's see how cold it can get in here. We got it down to Arctic temperatures. You were seeing frost on your breath and all that. It's a little exaggeration, but it was pretty cold in here. And people came in, and somebody came in and said, Pastor, it's too cold in here. <laughs> it's always too cold. I don't know why it's got to be so cold. I'm just thinking, man, I love that it's cold. I want to, like, I want to like snuggle in a sleeping bag in the church. <laughs> you know? It's just awesome. Just, just crank it, man. Why? Because God gave us air conditioning. It's a great thing to have air conditioning, but you know there's always people that can be down about something and they can complain about anything. They can complain about something like having air conditioning. Now, how dumb is that? When you think about it, would you rather have air conditioning or not have air conditioning? I'd rather have air conditioning. Some people would rather not have air conditioning. Yeah, because you're just a complainer. Just a complainer. I, I, I had somebody tell me, I, I, I wish we didn't have air conditioning. I'd rather not, I'd rather not have it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. So I don't want to talk too much about that. Now I want to get to the point. <laughs> you guys ever been to the doctor's? Anthony. That's it. That's your last laugh. You ran out. All right. Doctor's office. You guys ever been to a doctor's office or you ever seen, um, you ever seen the side of an ambulance where they have like that snake? On a pole, yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah it's like if you, you see on the door of a doctor's office, or if you see on the side of an ambulance. Yeah, you see like the snake twisting around a pole. Here's where that came from. You ever wonder why is a doctor got a snake on a pole? Me personally, I think that doctors and snakes shouldn't be friends. <laughs> you know, I don't want to go to a doctor and find a snake there. And honestly, when I was a kid, I just didn't. Sometimes I'm a little dense about some things. I never put two and two together. I never connected it. So when I was a kid, uh, I'd see a doctor. I'd, I'd see a doctor's off, or I'd see an ambulance with that on it, or I'd see a doctor's office. We'd go visit somebody in the hospital, and you'd see that snake in that pole, and you'd be like, "Why is that the sign for medicine? Why is that the sign for medicine?" Well, here it is in the Bible. Okay, so the Bible says they complain against God, and in, in the Bible says in verse six, the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, much people of Israel. Died. Much people of Israel died. Okay, so fiery serpents. What's a fiery serpent like? So it got like is it a, a snake with like you know a match on its tail, something like that. Now a fiery serpent, we think from what we can understand, is a snake that uh, had venomous fangs, and uh, I think they're they're supposed to be really small snakes, and supposedly they could they're really fast, they could strike really fast, and uh, so they had their little fangs and. They were real sneaky, and they were all over in the camp among the children of Israel. And they'd come by, and they'd go, like that. And they'd bite you. 
And the Bible said when they bit you that you died. Now, I've been told by people that think they know what kind of snakes they were, that those snakes were called fiery serpents because every time those snakes bit you, it literally hurt so bad where they bit you at that it felt like fire because of the way the venom felt. And then when the, when the blood coursed through your veins and went around on you, it literally felt like you had a fire going through your body and you were burning up until you died from it. That's a kind of miserable way to die, actually. I don't like snakes anyway. If y'all are snake people, I don't mean to offend you. I know you like sprinkles and stuff like that. So <laughs> you might like snakes too, but I don't like them. And I sure don't like poison snakes. And so these fiery serpents, they bite people and they die. And that was a pretty terrible judgment. And I'll be pretty honest with you, they kind of deserved it, didn't they? I mean, they, I understand being discouraged. I understand things being hard in life. But blaming God and then saying you don't have any bread when you actually do have bread, you kind of deserve it, don't you? They deserved it. And then the Bible says, Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, we have spoken, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. Well, they pretty quickly realized that it's better to have bread and have a long walk than to be bitten by fiery serpents. It doesn't really take much more than for things to get worse for you to realize things that weren't that bad, does it? You ever had things get worse? And you realize, I wish things were the way they were when I thought things were bad. Things just got worse. And so they went to Moses and they said, Moses, they said, would you please, would you, would you pray and ask, ask the Lord that He takes the serpents away from us? And the Bible says Moses did. Now, this is very gracious of Moses if you think about it because who did they complain about besides the Lord? Moses. Moses. So the very guy that they said, yeah, I don't like Moses, man. I, I'm, well, we have to follow Moses. Why do we go Moses? And they, you know, they whined about Moses. Well, after they whined about Moses, then they go to Moses and say, Moses, may God stop killing us. And the Bible says Moses prayed to God. And God said, the Lord said to Moses, oh, that you're one over, bud. You're, you're, you don't get to laugh all next week. That's it. Alright, the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that's been, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And the Bible says, And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole, and came to pass, that if a serpent had been any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Here's how it was. So this room's a camp. This is not quite a serpent of brass, but Charlie has a camera here. And uh, here, let's turn it around real quick. So Charlie's got a camera here. And let's imagine that this is the pole that's in the middle of the camp, if you'd like to right now. Okay, so here it is in the middle of the camp. And if you could imagine a serpent of brass being on it, it probably would have been up pretty high. Charlie, you can just hold that up there like that, okay? So now if you guys could imagine a brass snake being there, this is kind of like a brass pole, right? Having a, having a pole in the middle of the camp, then having a brass snake Wound around the pole. Let's paint it that way. Oh, it's Anthony. All right. Um, so you hold it up there like that. I don't like cameras anyway. Um, <laughs> so you got the brass pole, or you got the serpent with the pole on. Okay, so now it's in, he's kind of in the center of the camp, isn't he? So there's really nowhere that you could be in this room and not see that, right? Can everybody see it? Yes. Hey, Whitney. Wake up, Whitney. I want to see. Make sure you can see it. Whitney. Whitney, can you see it? Can you see it? <laughs> no, 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 no. Look up, look up. Right there. Can you see it? Right there. Mr. Charlie's got okay. I want to make sure you can see it. Okay. So everybody can see it, right? All right. So now, the Bible says that anytime, anywhere, if a serpent came and it bit somebody, the Bible says that if they looked at the serpent, that they lived. Now, what does that imply? implies that if they didn't look at the serpent, they die, right? Okay. Now let me ask you a question. What's so magical about a pole and a serpent that's made out of brass? What's so special about it? I mean, we've all been to doctor's offices where they had it. The doctor didn't go like, look at the brass serpent. Does he? What's so special about the pole and the brass serpent? It's God's pole. God's, I mean, there's nothing more special about it except that God said to do it, is there? Now, now, let me ask you a question. If you're a logical person and you're thinking, okay, I got bitten by 
a venomous serpent and it'll kill me. I'm supposed to look at the pole. Now, I'll be honest with you, I don't really care about logic. I mean, if I've been bitten by a venomous serpent, I'd say, look at the pole! <laughs> you know? I have like bite me again. <laughs> Go ahead, take another shot. <laughs> yeah, whatever. I mean, if I know what to do, I'm going to do it, right? Once I know that it worked. Well, here's the thing. You know that there were people after that serpent was put up, they got bit by the brass pole, or they got bit by the serpent, not the brass pole. They got bit by the serpent, and they wouldn't look at the pole and they died. <coughs> Say it again. They're stupid. They're stupid. They're stupid. There's nothing magical about a brass pole, but there's something special about obedience to God. There's something about believing God. Later on, God had promised when the first man sinned. You know the story about the first sin? Adam and Eve in the garden. Oh, yeah. You guys know that story? Yeah. Adam and Eve were in the garden. God told them not to eat of the forbidden oh, yeah. fruit. And they ate of it. Yeah, the snake deceived Eve. And then uh, they sinned, and so that's why people died. I just a couple weeks ago went and preached a funeral for my 100-year-old great aunt. She was an octogenarian. That means she lived 100 years. The state of Kansas declared her birthday a state holiday because she lived in a senator, came to her birthday party, and within a few months she died. Three weeks before she died, she looked at the brass serpent. I'm telling you the truth. Three weeks before she died, she looked at the brass serpent. My whole life, my family has been praying for my great aunt Margie. We prayed for her literally our whole lives. And we prayed that she'd be born again. And she'd always told us, I'm, I'm a good person. I'm just as good as you are. And she was just a good person. I'm just as good as you are. And I'm not, you know, I'm not a bad. And I'm, you know, she'd show us that she was enrolled in Sunday school when she was a kid. She'd tell us all these reasons why she was going to heaven. But before she died, she started thinking. And uh, about a month before she died, she got to really thinking hard about, I wonder if I really do know I'm going to heaven. And she fell. And she got hurt. And she was in the hospital. And she got pneumonia. And didn't look very good. Didn't look like she was going to make it very long. And she, my mom and dad were up visiting and they were taking care of her. And they asked my mom and dad, she asked my mom and dad, she said, is Ryan going to come? That's my name. I'm Ryan. Is Ryan going to come and see us anytime soon? My mom said, oh, well, he's supposed to come next week. And she said, I think I can hold on until then. And so the next week, Mrs. Price and, and Mandy and I, we went to Kansas to see my mom for Mother's Day. We got in about 9 o'clock. The first thing I did was went out to see Aunt Margie. Now, she's deaf. She's complete, like she, she can hear a little bit with hearing aids, but she turns them down to save the batteries. Don't laugh. This is funny. You're out of laughs. She has these hearing aids, had these hearing aids, and she had to turn them way down, right? So we go in the hospital, it's after visiting hours, it's in like the ICU area, and, and you're supposed to be quiet. I walk in the door and she says, I need you to make sure that I know that I'm saved. I said, hi Aunt Margie. She didn't say, hi Ryan, I haven't seen you in a couple years. And she said, I need you to make sure, and she yelled it at me. And so I, I got my, I, I tried to get a Bible out. And it was too small. I got my phone out and I got a Bible on it. And I showed her what Jesus told a man that wanted to be saved. Jesus had a man, his name was Nicodemus. It's in John chapter 3. And Brother, uh, Brother Duke's going to preach from there later on this evening. He'll tell you some of the rest of this. But Jesus had a man named Nicodemus that came to him at nighttime. And he was a ruler in Israel. He was a religious leader. He was a Pharisee. He was very, very religious and a very good person. He was respected among all of his peers. And actually in all of Israel, there probably wouldn't have been a man that would have known as much about the Old Testament law and as much about God as Nicodemus did. And yet he came to Jesus at night, the Bible says, and acknowledged. He said, I know that you came from God because of the miracles that you do. He said, no man... I could do the miracles without doing us to accept God with you. Go ahead and put it down, Charlie, for just a minute. Now put it back up. Hold it up. <laughs> okay. So he said, No man can do the miracles without doing us to accept God be with him. And Jesus told Nicodemus, He said, Verily, verily, he said, I'm telling you the truth. Except a man be born again, he cannot see or cannot enter the kingdom of God. He told him that. 
told Nicodemus, you've got to be born again. Now, now, listen to me right now because everybody needs to know this. Every single one of us has the same problem Nicodemus does, and that's that we have to be born again, born twice. Now, let me just take a second. Matter of fact, we like to clap, don't we? Let's congratulate ourselves real quickly. Good job, Nick. Good job. Good job. Okay. All right, you just congratulated yourself for the excellent job that you did of being born. Every one of you did such a good job that I can actually see that you accomplished it. You got born. Good job. Congratulations on your birth. Happy birthday, whenever it is. Okay? So every one of you were born. You did a fine job of it. But the fact of the matter is that none of you can honestly say you can remember doing it. Can you? No. You say, I remember being born physically. You know, when I came into this world, first thing I happened is I got slapped and the doctor said, wow, that's ugly. <laughs> no. no, you can't remember, can you? You don't remember that. Maybe you got pictures, you know, well, I hope you don't, but maybe you got pictures of when you were first born. You know, your mom has those embarrassing baby pictures that you don't remember her taking. You would never let her take if uh, you knew about it. All that stuff happened, right? You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Okay, every one of you got born and you had, you're not allowed to laugh. Every one of you got born, and you did a good job of it, but actually you didn't really do it. It just kind of happened, didn't it? Yeah. I mean, if I could have controlled things, I'd have had my birthday on Christmas. <laughs> and when everybody's going around celebrating, I'd be like, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you know, I'll take the credit for everything. You know, but I didn't have anything to do with it. I was born on June 26th, my parents tell me, and I just have to believe them because I don't remember. <laughs> Boys and girls, Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And Jesus said, I'm not talking about physical birth, I'm talking about spiritual birth. And the difference between people, listen, the difference between people who are going to heaven because they have eternal life and the people who are going to be judged by God for their sin eternally, the difference between those people is whether or not they've been born again. And Jesus illustrated being born again this way. He said, nobody's been to heaven. He said, no man has ascended to heaven but the Son of Man which has come down from heaven. Here's what He meant. Jesus said, not a single one of you know how to get to heaven by yourselves. That's actually true, isn't it? Yeah. Heaven's where God is. That's how I will define heaven this evening. Heaven's where God is. And the question I'd ask every one of you, and I'm asking honestly and asking for a sincere answer, where is that? The sky, okay. From China or from America? All around. Heavens everywhere. Yes. No, no. God's a real. God's a real physical God, and He's in a real physical place. No. What? The Bible says up. It's up from where? China or America? Yes. Say if it's down from one of them, isn't it? Yes. It's probably up from Israel. <laughs> it's confusing, isn't it? The thing is, here, here, get this. So many people, so many people think that when they die, and everybody's going to die, even my 100-year-old aunt, she died. She's in heaven, but she died. 100 years old, I hope I don't live to be 100 years old. She did, and when she died, she went to heaven, but she didn't know where it was until she looked to Jesus, because Jesus said, I'm the only person on earth who's ever come from heaven. Can you imagine trying to go somewhere not knowing where it was? Yes. Some of y'all, it's like trying to go home. I try to drive in a bus. <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, honestly, you know, the truth of the matter is, is that a lot of you guys, you couldn't get somewhere in Fort Lauderdale because you don't know where it is. I mean, you're honest. Some of you are good directions. Some of y'all are terrible. You couldn't get somewhere in Fort Lauderdale because you don't know where it is. You like trying to go to vacation in Hawaii by just expecting to get there. Can you imagine? How many of you guys would like to go, you know, geezer trip is a vacation in Hawaii. Okay, the geezer excursion. Yeah, let's do this, okay. Alright, so we go to Hawaii and uh, I say, meet me at the church. We'll go on vacation to Hawaii. Okay, so number one, two, and three, first, second, third place winners. Meet at the church with Mr. Charlie, Mr. Taj, Mrs. Price, and me. And we got all our luggage packed. And Charlie shows up with those ridiculous shirts that he wears and those orange shorts that he has. And, uh, you know, it looks like he's going to Hawaii. And here we are standing there. We've got our shades on. we got our umbrellas up. And we're like, we're going to Hawaii, man. And uh, we're talking like surfer dudes and looking like Mr. Charlie and all that stuff. And somebody drives by. 
And maybe it's your parents who are like, what are you guys doing? Going to Hawaii? Oh. Somebody else drives by and they're a little more curious. What are you guys doing? Going to Hawaii? When? Right now. How are you going to get there? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. Okay? Now, guys, think of that. Think of it. Does that make any sense at all? I'm going to Hawaii. I don't know where it is. And I don't know how I'm going to get there. You know how many people, listen now, I'm going to be serious for a second. You know how many people think that when they die, that they're going to go to heaven? And they have no idea where it is, and they have no idea how to get there. Most people. Most people. Jesus told Nicodemus, he said, you don't know where heaven is. And he said, you don't know where it is. And you don't know how to get there. But he said, I came from there. And he said, as Moses lifted up, lift up now, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Everybody looking at that? Okay. He said, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now I want you to look to the back of the room. You see that poster? You see the bridge in the poster? Yeah. What's that, what's that picture of? It's a cross. Who died on the cross? Jesus. Jesus did. Why did Jesus die on the cross? For our sins. He died for our sins, didn't He? And Jesus said, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Young people, every single one of us has been bitten by sin. You were born a sinner. Matter of fact, you were born with the same curse that Adam had. Uh, you're going to die a physical death. And if you die, and you don't look to the cross first, my friend, you'll be eternally separated from God. Where's the place beneath the cross? Hell. Hell. Literally, if you go to hell, it'll be because you didn't look to the cross. See all those people on the right side of that picture? Now, this is just a picture. It's just an illustration. It's not entirely accurate. But you see all those people that are just walking right into hell? Mm -hmm. yeah. And all they need to do is look at that cross and go right to it. <coughs> and they'll be able to get to heaven. Jesus is the way. He said in John 14, He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In our text tonight, the last words that we read were in verse 9. The last two words that we read was shall live. No, I'm sorry. He lived. The Bible says in verse 9, Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. It came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. When I was four years old, I realized that I was bitten. It occurred to me, and I realized that I was a sinner, and that God, if He's fair, is going to judge me. If I ought to judge someone else, He ought to judge me. If God judged me, in my sin, I'd go to hell. As a four-year-old, I that was true for me. And I also realized that Jesus died for my sin. I didn't have anything to say. I didn't have anything to say about God. I didn't have anything to say about my life. I simply said, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know Jesus died for my sin. I'm asking you to save me because of the cross. Because Jesus dying for my sin. Young people, that's how you look to Jesus. God made salvation a gift. Made eternal life a gift, being saved. Just like God made it easy for the children of Israel when they were bitten by the fiery serpent. And you know something? Jesus used the illustration in John chapter 3. He said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. You ever read that in the Bible before? As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. There's nothing complicated about being healed from a fiery serpent. All you had to do was look. And by looking, you acknowledge that you believe God. If you didn't believe God, you wouldn't look. If you say, oh, that couldn't work. I don't believe that. You'd die. The same is true about Jesus and the cross. You can say, I don't believe that. Or you can say, yeah, I believe Jesus. Teenagers, sometimes we have a hard time believing things. But you know, believing real hard or believing real easy or however you believe, that's not important. Looking is important. And any person who says, I want to be saved. I want God to save God. I want to be saved. I want Jesus to be my Savior. My friend, that's enough. That's enough. That's how much you have to believe. Enough to look to Jesus. You know, you think maybe some people were a little bit skeptical about that whole grass serpent in the middle of the camp? 
You think some skeptical people looked anyway? Yeah. yeah. When did they know that it was true? When they looked and they didn't die. You know if that's you? You say, well, I, yeah, I, I, I mean, I want God to save me. I want Jesus to be my Savior. If that's all true, I want to believe it. Well, try it. Try it. That's how I got saved. That's how anybody who's ever gotten saved got saved by looking to Jesus. All right, we're done. I'm going to pray. And we're going to have our game time. We're going to have our snack time. Brother Duke's going to draw a conclusion to the things that I've said. Father, thank you for what you taught us this evening. And I pray that you would increase the truth in our hearts and help us to believe it with all of our hearts. And help us to remember Numbers 21. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. That's a great story, isn't it? Yeah. Think you can tell it to somebody? Yeah. You can just read it and tell it. All right.